Hey guys, John Paulamy here, Actionable Intelligence. Today is Saturday, September 30th, and this is the weekly market update. The disclaimer, anything that you see or hear on this video or podcast is not to be taken as investment advice. I am not a registered financial advisor. I cannot give you personal financial advice. Please do your own due diligence on anything that you hear on this podcast or video. It's your money. It's your responsibility. Okay, so um, you can sign up for GMO. It's a kind of a shop, Jeremy Grantham shop. If you don't know who Jerry, Jeremy Grantham is, he's a very successful investor. I think he's a billionaire. But uh, I do occasionally post their uh, seven-year forward-looking return estimates. I've done that before. They come out. This is available for free. A lot of information there. You just have to sign up on their website. I mean, they do money management, but they have uh, resources like other other firms do. You can read. They'll email you. And so this is their quarterly letter, just a couple snippets. I'll put a link to it. Uh, I believe you need to register to get it, uh, get it sent to you. I think you just got to give an email and uh, something like this. But anyway, um, what they're talking about is something that I think that I kind of have been pondering is the fact that are we looking at higher rates for longer and higher inflation and why we would have higher inflation. I'm not talking about nine or 10%. I'm just talking about not 2% like the Fed is targeting, you know, maybe three or 4%, something like this for a longer period of time. So this kind of gets into it a little bit uh, and what causes that. I thought it was interesting. Here's a couple snippets from the article it says uh, today there are a few key issues that will make this cycle different notably the sharp increase in interest rates the likely persistence of inflation and a corporate tax change in the u.s that seems to have gotten less notice than we believe it deserves those factors make us believe that a recession when it occurs will be harder to cushion and that highly levered corporations will fare worse in a recession that investors might assume from past cycles. And this is exactly what I have been saying. Uh, I don't have the empirical evidence, obviously, but I, I have said that um, generally my view of the U.S. economy is it's a indebted economy. <clears throat> excuse me. It's a consumer-based economy, debt-based economy. It floats on a sea of debt uh, because of the fact that we had over a decade of either zero interest rates or very very low interest rates, a lot of bad behavior and bad habits were enabled. And a lot of businesses and industries came into being that probably wouldn't exist at five or 6% interest rates. And I think we're starting to see that now. And so that's what this is getting into a little bit. Uh, I was interested, read the article about the tax changes uh, that go into effect that I wasn't aware of that were fairly interesting, um, uh, I thought. Um, the other snippet from this article that I put on here is, uh, says, on the other hand, not all equities look particularly vulnerable to a recession and plenty of assets are trading at prices that suggest decent medium term returns, even if a recession occurs. While we are avoiding assets that are either particularly expensive versus history, growth stocks, or not offering enough return for their higher than normal risks they embody today, the debt and equity of junky and highly levered companies, particularly those in the U.S. where tax law has become more unfriendly, we can find a number of assets around the world that offer very appealing expected returns for their risks. In fact, after facing an investment desert as recently as the end of 2021. And so... I think it goes without saying, most people should understand by now that the U.S. market is overvalued, that we're, you know, we have one of the greatest bubbles of all time. I'm not going to get into that again. But again, you know, we strive, I strive at the Actionable Intelligence Alert newsletter to try to find things that are either out of favor, have been ignored, um, blown up, whatever. And now, after a period of basing, are having some kind of catalyst, some kind of event, some kind of uh, something that will 
change the market's view of it and revalue it higher. Business turns around. This is why, you know, uranium is hitting on 16 cylinders right now. Everybody listening to this knows about that. Offshore services is hitting on 16 cylinders. But these were things that we got into, in some cases, in the case of uranium, several years ago, many years ago, actually, five years ago, and had to exercise an extreme amount of patience. This is the thing that's lacking among most so-called investors. Um, they just chase shiny objects and they can't, they can't look at a situation, it seems, that's undervalued and then just sit there and wait for it to be mean revert. I mean, that's how simple it can be in some cases, you know, and this is the same thing that why I've been adding some uh, companies outside the, the U.S. because they're undervalued, you know, emerging markets, frontier markets, some of these markets that have uh, commodity based economies or derive a lot of their revenue from commodities or resources, um, I think are poised to do well over the next decade, especially in the context of a, what I think is going to be a resource, I'm hesitant to use the word super cycle, but let's call it bull market for all of the reasons that we've talked about before. And so that's why I think you should, you know, maybe take a look at uh, these guys subscribe or take a look at these articles because you know, that's what's also been pointed out in the forward seven year look aheads that GMO puts out is that, you know, the expected annual return on U.S. stocks over the next seven years is negative return, ne negative single digit return each year um, over the next seven years, while uh, emerging market value and emerging market stocks are poised to give you single digit positive returns annualized. So, um Again, it goes back to what we've discussed many times and what I have done. You know, this is what I encourage folks to do. Look at the successful investors. I'm not talking about, you know, your brother, your ex-brother-in-law that's talking about Bitcoin when you're shooting pool in the basement at Thanksgiving. I'm talking about people that are billionaires, Jeremy Grantham, Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, you know, Paul Singer, all these guys I, I've named all the time. Uh, people that put Howard Marks, read their letters, read their philosophies, read their books if they have them. A lot of this stuff is um, online. There's a there's a Twitter follow that you can follow. I think it's called Compounding Quality. He puts all of these people's letters and Joel Greenblatt, for example, his Columbia Business School course in PDFs and gives them away for free. I don't know how he's able to do it, but he's, he does it. And so what you'll find that the common theme is, is buying things that are cheap. OK, finding something that's selling, finding a dollar that's selling for 50 cents and then, you know, waiting for it to, you know, be revalued to a dollar again. I mean, that's simplistic version, obviously, but that's what we try to do. And, and the value isn't in U.S. growth stocks right now. So um, just wanted to point this out. This is another resource, something that I use, read and find useful. But I, I, I think these two uh, snippets from this particular uh, letter uh, are indicative and kind of uh, mirror some of the thinking that I have had for a while. And, uh, you know, this is why I'm looking more and more at emerging markets and frontier markets for value. So we'd like to talk about the consumer here. Here's a chart that was on Bloomberg. It says U.S. excess savings depleted for bottom 80% of households. Um Here's your uh, household income, 0 to 40%, 40 to 80. Here you go right here. There is no more excess savings. The COVID, the pandemic freebie money is gone. It's been blown. Uh, they have spent the money. And so what I say about that, why, is because, again, we're a consumer-based consumer economy, and it appears that the free money, the excess savings has been spent and there's nothing to replace it so again the last leg of the bullish economic argument is employment but uh the cracks are forming and so i am still holding to my view that i think that we will have you know i don't get into soft lands we're going to have a hard landing whatever that means we're going to have a severe recession uh and then the you know i expect that the market could retreat 30 or 40 percent maybe more uh, uh i don't fair value is it depends what the earnings are 
at that point, but there's no reason why the S&P couldn't go down 30 or 40%. And so I see no reason to deploy a lot of the cash I've been accumulating. Yes, you know, does that mean I'm selling all my stocks? No. I mean, uh, my recession call has been a little bit wrong. Oil prices have went up, energy prices, you know, the, that was helped a lot by the OPEC plus Saudi and OPEC plus uh, voluntary cuts. You know, I'm going to stay bullish on oil as long as the cuts stay in place through the end of the year, which then we'll reassess. But uh, that's another burden on consumers, along with the re-initiation uh, of student loan payments, along with the lack of savings now has dissipated. So, you know, we know that credit card debt is at an all-time high. We know that delinquencies that are all-time high. So the consumer is going to be stressed. And if jobs, if we do, if we do start seeing uh, layoffs, if we do start seeing uh, employment crack, then we are going to uh, rapidly descend into a recession, in my view. Parts of the economy are already in a recession. And so that's my view. And I think that's going to lead to a uh, you know, something happening, something breaking. And, you know, that corporate debt market is one thing I'm looking at. High yield debt, junk debt. Uh, will it be able to hold up? You know, an argument's been made. A lot of, well, these companies refinanced when rates were low, so it won't be a problem. Uh, well, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Talking about oil, I mean, I mean, this goes back to 2014. So the danger when I put these charts up isn't like I'm trying to make a point. I'm just reporting the news. I'm not people that know more than me, people that are in the oil market, they could say, well, this isn't a big deal because this happened back in 2015. Um, so what it happens, you know, it's not that big of a deal or it could be a big deal. But I guess, you know, you need a minimum stockpile, I think, at this storage in Cushing just to keep the pipelines viable. You can't drain tanks to zero uh, I don't think that that's viable. So uh, I don't know what this means uh, exactly, if it just reverses or what. But when you say minimum operating level, if you drop below that, what does that mean? So something to keep in mind, you know, what I'm trying to get to the point of is that, um, you know, we have this view that demand's not going away. It's funny, I read more and more about how like the IEA and these folks have been talking about demand destruction and that demand's gonna peak and all these things, it's ridiculous. I think it probably will peak in the West at some point. I say the West is like the OECD countries, but any barrel that stop oil or end oil or environmental people or are mandated not to be used in the US, Canada or Europe are just gonna be used in the global South and East, okay? These countries want to become wealthy. They want to get what you have. That's enabled by energy inputs. That means petroleum and coal and that kind of stuff. So if you don't want to use the molecules in the West, they'll use them in the East, global East and global South. I've said that before. And uh, right now I've, I've said, you know, because of the lack of investment, we talked about it before and some other factors, you know, we, we are looking at this molecule shortage. We're looking at this shortage, I think, uh, due to the underinvestment. This kind of gets into his uh, Goring and Rosenzweig uh, sent out this email. Uh, I'm on their email list. It's free to get on there. These are some comments from their last, uh, this blog they put out, blog slash email, what have you, uh, references the last quarter commentary. A couple blurbs here that I found interesting. You can go back and look at it. But it's just a reminder, kind of, you know, all of these things, like this type of news, and then you start, you know, re reminding yourself of the, overall secular trends it starts to you start thinking okay at, you know now i know why we're at you know 93 dollars a barrel maybe going higher uh the quote is this first snippet we are adamant in our belief that the this bull market has only begun and prices will increase all of the bullish elements we have discussed remain firmly in place the industry is still highly capital starved oil demand is strong and the U.S. shales are depleting. And so I'll pause here to make a comment. Uh, this is exactly the thesis that I accept. And, and as long as these remain in place, you know, there's nothing you can do about the geology of the U.S. shales depleting. But if the industry remains capital starved and oil demand continues to increase, prices have nowhere to go but up. 
you know, I don't think people really have an appreciation. I've said this before, but I'll reiterate it. An appreciation of how important the shale development so-called revolution over the last 10 or 15 years in the U.S. was to the global oil supply. Uh, it basically kept us from basically having supply crash. And so where's the next big fields? Where's the next big discoveries? Because as shale rolls over, it's not going to go to zero tomorrow or next year. But as fields peak, they go into decline and they go into irreversible decline. And so then, you know, you're on the Red Queen's race. And so just to, just to replace the production that's depleting, you need to do that. And in addition, you need to find new reserves to, to meet the growing demand. And so this is why I think, yes, you're going to have periods of uh, pullbacks or, or what have you, or if we have a deep recession, you know, that obviously will affect the price of oil. Uh, anything can happen when speculators get on one side of the boat or, other, or the other. <clears throat> Excuse me. But I think ultimately... You know, over the decade, as I've said before, your chart goes from the lower left to the upper right. Continuing on from the uh, blog, despite headlines to the contrary, the oil market remained extremely tight over the last 12 months. Governments effectively hindered the bullish price signal by liquidating vast quantities from their strategic reserves. This is unlikely to continue, clearing the way for prices to increase. Yeah, that was a one-trick pony unlikely to be repeated. Continuing on, the oil market will be driven higher by lackluster supply caused by years of underinvestment. This is the key in my in my view. I'm pausing again. The years of underinvestment. So you're not going to fix it in one year or, or, or something like that. It's going to take multiple years of above average investment. And what we're finding, what we're starting to see, I think, uh, just at the margin, is we're spending a lot of money, but we're not getting a lot of bang for our buck. We're having to go into more, we're having to go into deeper water. We're having to go into more adverse conditions, more geologically complex. And that makes sense, right? More more co complex areas that cost more money and have more risk. Because you're, you're obviously, when you're developing energy resources or any resource, you're going to grab the low hanging fruit that's the cheapest and easiest to get. You don't go get the hard stuff. You know, the 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 dollar oil is gone. And so, you know, I'm not saying oh, every deposit that can be exploited at 60 dollars, but you, you get my point. And so you don't run out of oil, you just run out of cheap oil. And so, so assets that are long lived assets with fixed costs that have long reserve lives, ding, 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 i.e., the oil sands become particularly valuable as an almost like annuities in this type of environment. Now they're not going to be 10 baggers, but I think they'll give you above average returns over the duration of that time period because they've made all their billions of dollars of investments. The things are up and running. And so they can harvest those additional costs and they have a fixed cost profile. You know what it costs to process a ton of bitumen or whatever of oil sands at, you know, CNQ or Suncor. And so I think those are valuable properties, valuable in this context. Yes, everybody wants to go get, I know everybody wants to get the Canadian junior that trades on the Vancouver exchange for 25 cents a share. That's going to go to four or five bucks. I get that. It's going to go from, you know, 250 BOE to 10,000 BOE in a couple of years and you know become a millionaire and that and that's possible but that's getting less and less possible let's put it that way continuing on the oil market will be driven higher by lackluster oh i already went through this it says demand demand meanwhile will enjoy a persistent tailwind and continue to consistently surprise to the upside in our following letter we will write extensively on global commodity demand so this kind of is like a quick summary. Again, I fully encourage folks to read these Goring and Rosenzweig um, quarterly commentaries are just packed full of information that will give you a, a education on supply and demand in these resource markets. Um, this is one of my core you know, information sources. 
And, uh, you know, the, the evidence is overwhelming, not just in energy, but um, across the board in resources. I mean, look what's happening with uranium on a daily basis. I mean, we're like at 72 or $73 a pound now. Okay, so it's happening. And you're seeing, if you've been watching, you're seeing what has happened to the stocks. You can see the le the leverage, the the how they're leveraged to the price. Now, are things overbought? Do they overshoot? You can make that argument. But I'm just saying you can see what the possibilities are. So uh, it's not just in oil and gas. It's across the commodity sector, whether we talk about copper, you know, anything you want to talk about, basically, is suffering from the same type of underinvestment. You know, one of the things that I, tools I use, people ask me, well, how do you find the ideas that you get? And so one of the things I do is they have a tool in Google. You can uh, put search words in and basically you can set it up where you get an email daily or weekly or whatever for whatever that keyword is. So if I put Uzbekistan in, uh, basically Google, the search engine will find articles or find references for that day in on the internet of news articles or what have you that are talking about Uzbekistan. And it'll be four or five a day. Sometimes they're just, you know, whatever's happening there, like their under 20 soccer team played, you know, Mongolia or something. And that's what it'll be about. But sometimes it's about something important in the economy and you can set that up for anything and so one of the things one of the keywords that i put in there is uninvestable and so google search engine and i it, it, i don't get a response on this every day maybe once every few weeks it'll you know somebody will make a comment somebody in the media or an investor is getting you know say well such and such is uninvestable and so what's been popping up, and that will that will cue me, why do I do that? Because I'm trying to identify things that if there's a trend where there's a consensus around something being uninvestable, I, you know, I like to go dumpster dive and look for things that are beaten down, nobody wants, undervalued, what have you. And that's, this gets me thinking. And so when I consistently am seeing is China coming up on this. And I find it interesting, you know, I was listening to one of my favorite commentators. I, I really enjoy his, how he thinks. Every time I get a chance to listen to him or read anything he writes, uh, I'm really interested. And it's uh, Louis Vincent Gov. You've heard me mention him before. Gov Cal Capital or Research. And uh, a guy that uh, he's from France, I think. He lived in Canada for a while. He's lived in uh, Hong Kong or China for and worked there for like 25 years. So, you know, I find it interesting, you know, you listen to other so-called China experts, people that don't even live there. And, you know, you take a guy like Kyle Bass. Kyle Bass is a very wealthy guy, very sm smart guy, successful investor, but he's been beating the China bear drum for, gosh, 15 years that I've been listening to him. I can remember when I first got my first iPad probably. And that was like, you know, 2008 or something like that. I mean, it, it never ends. And so uh, not to bash on Kyle Bass, I'm just saying that some of these people are like perma bears on it. And so I've always come at things and it took me a while to learn this, that it's never as bad as it seems and it's never as good as it seems. And so what Louis Vincent Gavi said is, Hey, look, you know, when people talk about China, they're always at an extreme. You know, they're either saying China's hitting on 16 cylinders, it's going to take over the world, blah, 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 or China's going to collapse. And it's not normally like that. And so, you know, this is just a few things from Bloomberg here or that I got or off of Twitter showing, you know, China shopping activity remains strong in September. You know, because, you know, we're being told that China sucks. China's going to collapse demographically. China, blah, blah, blah. We're going to go to war with China. China's behind. All these different things. China's not recovering from the COVID and, uh, you know, whatever. And I think I don't like that consensus. It very well could be true. But what I've seen is, is you know, is China uninvestable or is China so maligned that it's a contrarian type situation? Now I'm content 
to play in my other emerging market sandbox, as I mentioned earlier. But, you know, you're seeing here, you know, things, at least from this data that we're showing here, is it's not collapsing. Yes. Is there a real estate problem there? Yeah. We had, you know, uh, but is, you know, does that mean, you know, we had a real estate crash here too. We had the great financial crisis. And do I think that there have, it's, it's almost, you, you're never going to really know unless you're there, unless you're Chinese and you're really there and you probably still wouldn't know the full story. But again, you know, what are the probabilities? What's really going on? And, uh, you know, I admit that I was wrong about China after the pandemic. I thought there would be a bigger liftoff of the economy. There wasn't. But does that mean it's uninvestable? Does that mean the place sucks? Does that mean, you know, it's collapsing? Uh, that's probably not true either. So the question you have to ask yourself is, is the narrative that's putting put forward, is it worse than what's really going on? And does that give you a an arbitrage type play where you have undervaluation, that the narrative is more negative than what's really happening and prices are uh, have been beaten down past the point that they should have been? So to reflect the what's what's actually true. Now, it may be too complicated, but what I'm telling you is this is what's popping up on my radar. Again, you know, we have the Pentagon talking about having a war in 2025. And, you know, I don't, I'm not advocating investing in China. I'm just pointing out how my thinking is going, what's popping up on my radar. Uh, is it worth taking a flyer? Maybe. Um, but, uh, I mean, there's one oil field uh, pipe company that I, own a few shares and that's based in Hong Kong and it's like down 80 or 90 percent but I can't find anything wrong with the company it, it, it it's orders are up it's cash flows up is it just because it's a Chinese company I don't know so you know again I'm not saying that this is the buy of a lifetime but I, this is how my thinking goes and this is some of the things I wrestle with this probably is too complicated so I'll leave it in the you know too complicated file but uh this is what I'm looking at Things are never, again, I guess the lesson out of this is things are never as bad as they're portrayed and they're never as good as you think they are. So um, I think tempering expectation, but this is this is like one of the tools that I use. Like if it pops up, let's say that, uh, you know, at some point, let's say, you know, if house, you know, during 2008 housing crisis, I'm sure it would have popped up in this uh if it was available then that, you know, housing was uninvestable, you know, when things are at the bottom, they become uninvestable, right? Cause everybody's puked it up. Nobody wants to touch it. They've been burned. Even the people like Don Cox says, you'll see even people in the industry don't want anything to do with their own industry. The people that know it most uh, love it the least because they know it the best. And uh, that's when your opportunities start surfacing, right? When this page 20 story uh, starts making its way to page one. Wanted to point this out because I find things humorous. These uh, people. Um, this is the. Uh, this is a global energy monitor. This is a good website. Uh, if you're interested in energy, you should go there. You could spend hours on there. Uh, they have things just on coal plants. You can see down here. You can put in here operating under construction planned. You you can play around and. It will actually, you can then put your cursor on here, hit a button, and it'll expand and all. Uh, more information than you could ever digest. It's very, uh, very interesting for everything. I mean, every blast furnace on Earth, nuclear power plants, coal mines, gas pipelines, the whole shebang. So uh, that's not the point. Is I'm just pointing this out that if you want to geek out on this and you're bored, go to this Global Energy Monitor website. It's free. Uh, at least now, and you can uh, you can get these maps. The thing I'm pointing out here is notice where all the coal, these are all coal plants that are under construction um, that are in pre-planning or announced. So this is all the plants that are either, most of them, as you can see, are along the east coast of Africa and in India, China, this whole global east and south, if you will. Okay, so you can agree that that's where most of them give us one dot in the U S and a couple in South America and nothing going on in Europe, basically. But then you go over here and this is the climate pro protest tracker and where it's darkest is where most of the climate protests are. Notice the OECD countries with the globalist agenda, obviously Europe, 
okay, uh, the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, uh, India, I was actually shocked here, but look where most of the coal plants are, there's no protests. Where are the protests? When are the climate protesters going to go to China or Bangladesh or Pakistan or India or wherever, in Indonesia, and start having climate protests? There's not enough protests. And these are the places where the most emissions are going to be coming from. Well, the reason they don't do that is because first they'll be arrested and they'll be kicked out of the country because these people aren't going to put up with it, this nonsense. Why don't you go to China and glue yourself to the glue your hand at rush hour and see, I mean, the Chinese people probably run you over. They'll just see a hand, you just see a hand there decapitated with the tendons and bones sticking out and the body on the front of somebody's car or truck going down the road. Okay. I mean, that's not going to fly. And so they do it here because we have a permissive society that we, and we allow this nonsense. People say, what's well, free speech. I don't agree. I'm not going to get into a whole thing about what I think about free speech and all these rights and everything, but uh, let's leave it at this. Which one of these is not like the others? And uh, people will say, well, they're choking on particulate matter. Well, the point I'm trying to make to you is they're not going to, anything that you do over here, Mr. and Mrs. Climate Protester, isn't going to have any effect on anything because this is where all the emissions are going to come from. And there was a guy, I think his name's Constantine Chris or something like that. He has a he has a YouTube channel where he like debates, but he did a debate in Oxford and he laid it out probably in a 15 minute conversation, the best that I've ever heard. These people, this is his words, not mine. Okay. People in the global South and East in these poor countries don't give a shit. That's exactly what he said in Oxford about climate change. They're poor and they don't want to be poor. And until you address that, you're going to have more emissions. You know, he went through these stats about you know, how many people in some of these countries don't have flush toilets or stuff like or indoor toilet? I mean, the whole thing. Okay, so they're going to progress to that. In order to do that, they're going to need more energy. And it isn't going to be windmills and solar panels. It's going to be coal plants, nuke plants, whatever they can get their hands on. And why wouldn't they want exactly what you have? And so I just thought this was interesting. Uh, you can go check this out yourself. But uh, again, more of the hypocrisy. And again, you can get rid of oil, end oil in the UK if you want. It'll just get burned here. Every molecule that doesn't get used in these countries will get used in these countries. Get it? And so you need to, people need to get, re what, I'm, what I'm advocating for is a more rational-based, reality-based discussion instead of this alarmism and and fanaticism that doesn't get anybody anywhere so here we go here's uh this was on twitter i thought this was interesting because i'm seeing it already you know we talked about how fast and how far interest rates have come up and you know interest rates are you know when they're at zero like they were or near zero for 10 years Anything can get financed. You know, when you put a project together and go in front of a board or whatever and ask for money, you have to put all your costs and and what's the return. And they have hurdle rates. We want to see a minimum return for what we'll consider the project. And one of the biggest expenses with these large capital projects is interest expense. You have to finance the project. Nobody, most people don't have, you know, half a billion billions of dollars sitting around I'm talking about these renewable projects you know 150 200 million 500 million dollars sitting around and so they build it and they finance it and they say well after all of our costs yada yada paying everything we can make you know seven or eight percent a year or whatever it is and then the board says okay that's fine that's better than the risk-free treasury rate and we're willing to take that risk well that might be at zero percent interest rates what happens when the Fed funds rate is five and a quarter percent and the 10 year treasury is 4.75 or 4.8? Well, you're not paying that on these projects. You're probably paying eight or 9%. And so that changes the whole dynamic. Now you can't get the project over the hurdle rate. And so what we're seeing, I think, uh, you know, these are the, this is the solar energy index. 
free falling, here's the wind energy index because you can't make money. The projects don't work with these with these interest rates where there are with normalized call it normalized interest rates. And so that's why you see you know then throw into the mix commodity prices are not at you know 20 year lows anymore. Labor costs are high. All costs are high inflationary and so you know we 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 were sold this bill of goods well renewable rebuildable energy you know, we'll just get cheaper over time. What, like it's a semiconductor? The 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 the, the output will go up by a hundred percent, and the cost will go down by fifty percent every year. Moore's law doesn't apply to this. And so, what I think is, interest rates now being a major expense to finance these projects, they're not financeable. And now you see. These things are not good investments now. Now, if they cut rates to zero again, maybe this turns around. But look, this is this is like uh, you know, I'm not going to use the term of the uh, you know what Joe Granville said, but uh, well, I guess I will. You know, you know when he's talking about the stock market falling in 1982, it's like it's a looks like a turd falling from a tall Indian. I mean, this is straight down. Who's putting money in this? I wouldn't. And I think projects are going to start getting canceled because we're already seeing that. We already saw Orsted and some other companies come back, like in the UK and even here in the US. Oh, we were going to build this project. Now we need more money. You need to give us more money. We need a higher tariff or we can't make the project work. I thought prices were supposed to go down with rebuildables, the costs. So again, uh, it doesn't work. And you saw like, you know, this little dweeb, this little bed bug, Rishi Sunak, he's backing away now. He he's running to be the you know PM in the UK. He was appointed, you know. Now he's he's going to try to you know stay in power. And what's what did what did he do to find favor? So, you know, his polls are shooting through the roof now. Why? Because he's backed away from the the net zero goals for the UK. People don't want it. People don't want their costs going up. People don't want their standard of living going down. And so if you're a politician and you back away from it, you know, if you talk about a couple things here in the U.S. and people actually believe you, secure the border, deal with the out-of-control spending, and get prices down, I mean, you, and you have a viable plan to do those things, you're going to run away with it because those are the main things affecting people. And so that's going to translate back to this. And so we'll see how it goes. I don't think the globalists, uh, international globalists, are going to back away from this. Uh, they'll probably clam up for a while, but um, they're going to need more money to make this work now. And I, I wouldn't put money into this if I were you right now. This is interesting. It says uh, Poland uh, signs engineering contract with Westinghouse and Bechtel for first nuclear power plant. Um, country's first station to have three AP-1000 units on Baltic coast. You know, this is interesting. Poland has an opportunity, I hear, I think, here to leapfrog Germany. Um, Poland and Germany have a very tenuous relationship long-term. Let's leave it at that. And Poland, I think, is not going to be shy. You know, if the Germans want to deindustrialize because they have the highest energy costs in the EU, Poland's happy to burn coal and build nuclear power plants and take that manufacturing prowess away from or over time become wealthier while Germany and the rest of the EU becomes less wealthy. And uh, I'm not saying that's their main impetus to this, but I think people recognize that. I recognize it. Is it so It's something to watch. You know, if your cost structure is lower than your neighbor, guess where capital is going to flow where it's treated best, where costs are the cheapest and where the margins are the highest. And energy being an input, you know, Poland has a desire, I think, to become a, a manufacturing powerhouse. And don't think for a minute that Germans won't move uh, operations into there. I mean, this is like, how how do you, this is like the biggest I don't know, self-destruction mode thing I've ever seen. You turn off your nuclear power plants. Okay, not because they don't run right, not because you don't manage them correctly. They're some of the most well-built, well-run machines in the world. People acknowledge this in Germany, these nuclear power plants. Shut them off. 
and then listen to the United States get you involved in a land war with Russia, who you should be allied with. So you, you, you know, can you, I've, I've went through this before, you know, taking in the Russian cheap raw materials, cheap energy and raw materials with access as China is trying to build transportation links so they can pull all of, you know, have this trade go across that Eurasian continent and you allow the U.S. to blow up your energy source, your cheap energy source. What did you get out of it? You didn't even get a T-shirt. You just have Annalita bare, bare bones and Robert, you know, Hardbeck. I know those aren't their names. I'm just, they, these people aggravate me. And they're not even a majority. They got, you know, they finagled themselves into power, these positions of power, and they're destroying the country. And so Poland's thinking, well, you know, uh, this might be an opportunity. They maybe not recognize it. Maybe they do recognize it. And they can say, well, you know, we're going to, you know, it's like the difference between California and, you know, Texas or New York and Florida. That's why you have mass exodus out of those states because they suck. You go to some place where you're treated better. Capital goes where it's treated best or where the margins are highest for business. That makes sense, doesn't it? And this is a similar type situation in my view. Something that needs to be looked at. You know, there's always, you know, they get gas. Poland just commissioned a gas right after the Nord Stream was blown up by the United States and its proxies, which is an act of war, by the by the way. It wasn't five Ukrainian nitwits on a rented sailboat. If you believe that, I can't help you. You're not going to make it. It was the United States and some of its other allies. May have even been Germans involved, which is treason. But we'll probably really never know. Maybe 50 years down the road. I don't know. But in the meantime, the Poles commissioned a gas pipeline from Norway. It's in service. And so if you have a competitive advantage, why not take advantage? Why not push push the pedal to the floor? So it, it always pays to look at these things from just, you know, what some commentator on CNN for 30 seconds say and think it through yourself. I'm going to get into the political part of this now. Uh, those of you that uh, do not like my political views, those of you who are living in fantasy land, and those of you that are stupid should turn off the video now. I think that the United States is in terminal decline. I think I've titled this slide, we are living in the age of disorder. I am shocked. Maybe it has always been this way, but I have been shocked over the last year, 18 months, of the amount of just wanton violence, disrespect, chaos, and flat-out barbarism that I am seeing on TikTok, YouTube, what have you. People beaten for no reason, people attacked, looting, disorder, chaos, thievery, what have you people running around wild wild and crazy stuff that you would see on tv in some third world hellhole and you'd be like man i'm glad i don't live there and this is in american cities and nobody is doing anything about it you know if you live in a not in that area you're like well that's i don't i'm glad i don't live there what about the people that live there and so I'm just pointing this out, like, you know, and this feeds into what I'm saying. Monthly shoplifting incidents reported in the, to the San Francisco Police Department. Um, you see uh, the, this was a new way that they start reporting. This goes back, but you see the increase over time. And I think this is only goes to like last two years ago. Okay. And they don't even report them anymore. And so consequently, what's happening? I mean, we have a huge spikes in shoplifting. No, said the store manager. The store was simply using a new reporting system implemented by the police that allows retailers to report crime incidents over the phone. Oh, so we don't have an issue, right? Or do we? Oops, Target says it will close nine stores in major cities across four states because of theft and organized crime. You know, I remember when I was a kid, 
I don't remember what I stole. Maybe I was about five or six, or maybe a little bit older, seven or eight. I think I stole a pack of gum. And I think when we went, it was, a, it was an Eckerd's drugstore in Florida. And so we went out to the car. It was with my mother and my brother. And we, my brother and I were in the back seat, and I think I was divvying up the gum with him. My mother's like, where'd you get that gum? And then, you know, when you're a little kid, you freeze. You start trying to think of a lie or an excuse. She said, did you steal that gum from the Eckerd's? Uh, yeah. And so, I mean, it was like late. It was like 7.30 at night or something after people had been picked up from school or babysitters or whatever. Or she's coming home from work. I don't remember. So it's like, get out of the car. Let's go. We go back into the store. It's over a pack of gum in like 1978 or something. I mean, how much did it cost back then? 10 cents? Who cares, right? But this is how it used to be. And so my mom brings me back in there and she says, tells somebody there, get the store manager. So the store manager comes and my mom's like, got me by the nape of the neck. And she's like, tell this guy what you did. And I had the gum. It was like half eaten. Like some pieces were missing out of the pack. And I was like, I stole this gum. Of course, you start bawling and stuff. And the guy goes, well, you know, you shouldn't steal. And we're, I'm not going to do anything this time. But if it happens again, we're going to call the police. You go to jail. Yada, yada, yada. Don't do that. So, I mean, I didn't even, that's called home training. Uh, here we have, you know, used to get prosecuted for stuff like that. Okay, we had order, we had rules, because if we don't have rules and authority, okay, then we have barbarism. That's what we just, that's what we're descending into. Okay, and, uh, you know, Target is, uh, you know, one of these big social justice, you, they have a page, you can go on their corporate website, I did it, I didn't, I don't know if I put it on here, I might have put a slide on here, I don't remember. I think I have the uh, link, I'll put it. But, you know, they've given millions of dollars to social justice, you know, the, so the, they agree with this stuff. And then when the consequences hit hit home, you know, we're going to close the stores because uh, of theft and organized crime. You know, from the article, Target is closing nine stores in major cities across four states, claiming theft and organized retail crime have made the environment unsafe for staff and customers and unsustainable for business. Yeah, that's what happens when you steal everything out of the store. It's unsustainable to stay in business. The big box chain is part of a wave of retailers, both large and small, that say they're struggling to contain store crimes that have hurt their bottom lines. Many have closed stores or made changes to merchandise and layouts. Yeah, everything's locked up behind these plexiglass. So you want to get a tube of toothpaste, you got to get some underpaid, overworked, surly worker to come over there and unlock the thing so you can grab a thing of toothpaste. Because, you know, if they don't do it like that, they'll just, the people come in and steal because there's no rules. Somehow, you know, that's supposed to do what in the progressive's mind? The store's target, target plans to close will shut their doors on October 21st. The stores include the East Harlem location in New York City, two locations in Seattle, three locations in Portland, and three locations in San Francisco and Oakland. And I'm not going to go through each one of these cities. You should recognize that these were all progressive cities that said that police, you know, especially after the St. George Floyd incident, uh, said that, you know, certain demographic groups were being over prosecuted and over policed. And so we need to get rid of the police and, you know, put social workers out there like that's going to cure the problem or or we could say this. Unfortunately, we have uh, in some not you know, Portland and Seattle are probably a little bit different than some of these other cities, but we have uh, disorder and chaos, and we have people that have not been raised correctly, okay? And so when they close these, they can't steal there. Are they going to come out to the suburbs and start stealing out of your target? We don't have people running through stores, at least around where I live here in Houston or in South Texas. You're not going to go to the target in Brownsville or Harlingen and going over to trash bag and uh, start just filling up the garbage bag and walk out of the joint. That's not going to happen. They're going to call probably some of the people shopping there are going to jump on you. And if they don't, the cops are going to come. And if you give, if you give anybody any lip, you're going to be put on the deck tased or shot. Not going to have chaos and disorder. 
that seems to be the trend in a lot of these and, and that's progressive somehow what are you progressing to complete societal collapse that's society's better with dookie and needles on the street how is that progress these people are evil okay that enable this they're irresponsible most of the time they're incompetent. I've, I've listened to some of these people and this is being enabled and praised. And it's a descent from civilization into barbarism. I'm not for it. This can be fixed, but it's going to take a big effort and it's going to get, it's going to be ugly. You're going to have a lot of videos on there. People are going to get, have to take some beat downs. They're going to get body slammed. You're going to have to start putting people in jail. It can be dealt with, but is it politically possible in these cities to do that? I don't think so. Not with the current zeitgeist, if you will, in some of these places. So these 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 companies are just going to close everything up, and these places will be retail deserts. And then these uh, jerks are going to come into other neighborhoods because they think that they can just do that anywhere, and they're going to find out that they can't. It's not going to happen. So then you're going to have you know problems, and. Uh, you know, I don't know how this resolves. Uh, as I've said before, you know, societal collapse, civilizational collapse is probably in our future. That's why I don't think the United States will exist as a political entity, not just because of this, because of our debt, because of the stupidity of uh, we just have, you know, basically two groups of people with two different ways that they think philosophies on how people should live. And so I don't see how you can keep a union like that. Or you descend into a, you know, you're going to have, you know, economically, you're going to be like, if you want to know what your future is, look at how people live in Argentina and Turkey. Yeah, the society trundles along, stumble bums its way forward, but there's no prospects, there's inflation, there's regulation. Yeah, it's It's a mess. It's very hard to you know, have a middle-class life, have any kind of life, and uh, things are kind of dingy, and if you're super wealthy, you're doing fine, and everybody else is, can suck on it. That's the future for most people in the U.S. You get to be a serf in a cri and in crime-ridden areas where, you know, and people that have wealth and privilege, they'll live in gated communities with armed guards, and you won't have any access to that, and you won't mingle with them. And this has to be stopped. There has to be law and order. There has to be uh, rules. They have to be followed in order to have a civilization. Or you're just going to have barbarism. If you tell people that have been raised for a couple generations with no fathers in the home and just, you know, all kinds of pathologies being exposed to, that you can steal up to, you can take up to $900 or $1,000 worth of merchandise and we won't prosecute you. What do you think they're going to do? And so they can't stay in business. They're not running a, a, a goodwill center over there. And so they shut it down. And so the other people, the majority of people that are law abiding, they're, they suffer. And so then the delinquents figure, well, okay, they're like a virus or an amoeba, right? They just go to the next area and then, you know, try to infect it. But then you run in, you, you run out of the progressive area into an area that doesn't go along with that. And then you find yourself, you know, getting smacked upside the head with a billy club or getting tased. And, you know, then you have a big thing on the side of your head and a mugshot. Well, they didn't do this to me in San Francisco. Well, you're not in San Francisco anymore. We don't play that out here. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. Um, I don't see how this anybody can look at this and say, I want this in my neighborhood. You know, do I want Gavin Newsom as my president when he presides over this nonsense? Because this is the future. You know, they say what happens in California it happens there first, then it happens and they're the, they're the progressive that set the tone for the rest of the country. Is this what you want? Is this how you want to live? Where you're trying to go get a tube of toothpaste and they, you have to find some surly underplayed clerk to come over and unlock it. So you can, you know, so it takes, you know, 46 minutes to go there and get a tube of toothpaste because you got to unlock everything and get, I mean, come on. Anybody look at this, do you think this is normal?
So there you go. You know, I don't know everything that's happening in California because I don't live there, but people are leaving for a reason. Cost too much to live there. It's overcrowded. It's overregulated. It sucks. And uh, it's not helping it when they have all of this progressivism, rampant, out of control, open drug markets, illegal, unfettered immigration from the third world, thievery, chaos. I mean, who, who in their right mind wants to live in that? It's funny watching the buses of illegal immigrants being sent up to New York City and the people screaming at the mayor of New York. We don't want this in our neighborhood. Well, this is what you voted for because the guy said that he was said that New York was a sanctuary city. So Governor Abbott and DeSantis and these other folks, they're not my heroes of any any way, but you know, more of a stunt, but they they've sent, you know, busloads of immigrants there. Well, you're a sanctuary city. This is what you said you wanted. But what what I find interesting about these people is they don't want this. So are all those black people in those neighborhoods that I heard screaming at the mayor, are they racist? Why are you racist against Hispanic immigrants from Central America? You said this was a sanctuary city. People have stood up and said, we don't want them here. Get them out of here. I mean, you want to talk about, if that was a white person saying that, they would be labeled as virulently racist. White supremacist racist. You've got people in Staten Island talking about seceding from New York City. They don't want any more part of this nonsense. But this is what, so when people uh, vote for these things or put pol- leaders into place that have these policies, you know, and then they have to actually live the consequences of the stupid stupidity because that's the definition of stupidity in my view, the inability to attach cause and effect then they don't like it. Well, wait a minute. I mean, I thought this was all just platitudes and feel good. And, you know, you you wanted to have your open immigration, but you said you were going to give me freebies. Now I get less freebies because we got to, you know, spend billions of dollars keeping these illegal immigrants in hotels. It's easily fixed. Is the political will there? Grab them all up, send them back. You know, close the border. There's no political will to do that. Now, you have to ask yourself, why is that? What's the agenda? Well, the Republican Party and its donors want cheap labor. We've talked about this before. And the Democrats want a slave class that they can have as indentured servants and that they think will vote for them, that will replace the native population. The native population, I say, is white people and African Americans. Those are the original population of the of the United States. Yeah, that's what they want. African Americans are affected the most by all this cheap labor coming in. That's why they're screaming the most in New York City. They're bringing them to their neighborhoods. They're taking their services. So this is going to be interesting. Uh, I don't, unless it's stopped and reversed, it's going to take a big effort. And I don't think the political will's there. The media certainly isn't going to get behind any kind of effort. I mean, I'm I'm not going to say this. You can go look it up on Wikipedia. I'm not saying this to be mean. This is the actual name of the program. I think it was during the Eisenhower administration. It was called Operation Wetback. Go look it up. Don't tell me you can't deport millions of people. It's been done many times throughout the world over many different years in different situations. If the will is there, it can be done. You know, after World War II, all these Germans in Poland and Czechoslovakia were deported. When India and Pakistan got their independence from Great Britain, there were expulsions of Muslims from India and Hindus from Pakistan in the millions. You can go through, there's many examples. It wasn't really, in either case, very fun for the people that got expelled. And I don't blame the immigrants. If I was living in in some, I've worked in Central America, I see how a lot of the people live and struggle. And if I had the opportunity to come here and I heard that the border was open because my cousin's telling me 
come to Estados Unidos, the borders open. No one's going to stop you. Even if you get caught, they just put you on a, give you a bus ticket to where Denver or Chicago or New York and you can get a job. Why wouldn't I try it? Why wouldn't I do it? But if I'm told the border's closed, if they catch you, uh, they take your picture, they fingerprint you, and they throw your ass back across the border or send you back where you came from. They have planes in Harlingen at the Harlingen Airport. I don't know if they're still there, but during the Trump administration and the Obama administration, there are 737s that are completely white. And what they do is they, they used to catch the people and fly them back. They had a big, uh, in Raymondville, which is right north of Harlingen, they had a big compound where they used to hold all these people. The economy around that area was booming just because of the, det the detention center and all the jobs it produced. That's closed now. Why is that closed? Well, they have no, this administration has no intention of, you know, enforcing uh, and stopping the border. There was a, you can go on Twitter and Elon Musk went down there on Twitter. He had a, like a 20 minute thing yesterday. He was at the border talking to people, uh, doing investigative jur journalism talking with the sheriffs, talking with the politicians, talking with the congressmen from that area. They said it's totally out of control. No one's in Washington's doing anything. It's funny. They had the Texas National Guard down there, and they were trying to put barbed wire up, but the Border Patrol came and cut the barbed wire fence and let all uh, the immigrants in to the country. You have to ask yourself, we have laws in place that say that we should be stopping that. Why aren't those laws being enforced? Why isn't this administration doing that? Who's benefiting from not doing that? Why are they not enforcing the laws? Ask yourself that. Millions of people are coming here. You can't, and the same thing's happening in Europe. From, uh, you, you know, you, you may or may not seen the videos. And so I have nothing against these people. They're struggling. They want a better life. They're, they think they can, you know, the streets are paved with gold. And if they're told if they come here, uh, you know, everything's uh, going to be Shangri-La for them. Well, we'll see how that how that works out. But I, I think you should ask yourself, why are we not enforcing our laws? Why are we allowing this? Who's benefiting from that? I didn't know this, but, uh, well, I did know, but I didn't know the, the, the difference was this big. Californians pay the price for their politics, I labeled this. But uh, they have these special blends of gasoline out in California because of the smog. And this is a chart. Doesn't This isn't like the gas is $2.20 a gallon. This is the price of gas, how much above the national average it is. So gasoline in some areas of California is over $6 a gallon right now. This is another reason you can't live there. I mean, how much money do you have to make as an average salary to just live a middle-class lifestyle in California? And so this is the pump premium versus the U.S. average. So whatever you're paying, like here where I'm at, here up here in Houston, three forty dollars a gallon, add two six, that's $6.10 a gallon. I don't know. I wouldn't be driving around a big SUV or commuting 30 or 40 miles to work each way. I'll tell you that. Okay, guys, enough on that. Uh, that's it for this week. Again, things continue to rock and roll in the uranium market. I don't know if it's going to cool off. Um, I think finally the, the, we, we've crossed the event horizon into the era of higher prices. Uh, kind of like I was talking about before uh, during the last bull market where it would just steadily go up week after week after week, the price spot price of uranium would go up. And as you well know, if you've been following this market, we're in a totally different environment now. Okay. Back then, we weren't in a supply deficit like we were now. We weren't in a situation. Nobody was building any plants during the last, I mean, very few, if any, plants were being built. And so you didn't have demand pulling. You didn't have this push to get SMRs, another demand source, and you didn't have supply deficits. And we still got to $140 a pound uh, when uh, the Cigar Lake mine flooded. And now we have, again, I can't even keep up with all of the positive news that keeps coming out about uranium day after day after day. 
I mean, again, I tell you to follow John Quakes because he's real time. He's on vacation now gallivanting around Europe. But I think he took a day off from gallivanting around Europe because there was so much news. He had he couldn't help himself. He had to, you know, spend a day posting all this stuff. That's how fast and furious the good news is coming. I mean, there was a rumor that came out uh, that had to be clarified that, you know, there was going to be no more Russian exports of uranium from the U.S. to the U.S. through St. Petersburg because of insurance stuff. And, you know, and that was like, you know, the the markets, in it, what I'm trying to, the point I'm trying to make, it they ended up being not exactly accurate, but the market is so precarious that even a rumor like that got everybody's juices flowing. And uh, so I don't know if we're going to, this is going to lead to the blow off top. Um, I do think that, again, what I've said before, I think before this cycle is over, and I don't know when it will end, I don't know how it will end, I do think it will end in a super spike, and it will we will exceed the previous highs, inflation-adjusted highs from the last bull market. And I don't even think we've seen any institutional money come in. What I have seen recently, just in the last this last week, is you're starting to see some of these investment firms come out and start, rec they've started to recommend and raise their price targets on Cameco and stuff like that. And on Sprott Uranium Trust, uh, where they think the price of uranium is going. And so they're starting, you're starting to see that. And those client letters get pushed out to the brokers and that goes out to their clients. You know, what I'm saying is it kind of goes back to that, what Justin Hune talked about, the flywheel effect. You know, buying begets more buying. The price goes up, begets more news flow, begets more buying. And the momentum just keeps picking up and speeding up. And so have we entered, I mean, I, this might be, you might not like this, uh, what I'm about, you know, metaphor, analogy, whatever. Are, have we reached um, the chain reaction, like in a nuclear reactor where it's self-sustaining now and takes off to use a nuclear, you know, analogy, you know, have we reached criticality in the reactor and the reaction, this prices increases are able to sustain themselves and it draws more capital. And what happens when the institutional money starts coming in? That's the point I'm making as more and more of these investment firms, brokerages start writing up the research. That's when you're going to start seeing more institutional money start coming in. And when that happens again, as Doug Casey said, you know, a gold bull market is very, fun to participate in because it's like trying to put the contents of hoover dam through a fire hose and then he suggested that a uranium bull market's even more fun because it's trying to put the contents of hoover dam a drinking straw uh, i think you could figure that out all this money chasing trying to get into a small market you can have some i think i think that's how you end up with a blow off top and so i i know that there's people still just becoming familiar with this story and, and new money is coming in. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. Uh, I think that's, it's major. A uh, same thing is happening with offshore services. Uh, it's very bullish. Recently had a big conference in Norway. All the news out of that's bullish. Uh, fundamentals are, are bullish and uh, conference calls, management uh, discussions are all bullish and the previous thing that has short circuited previous uh, cycles, up cycles, the you know rates going up and then that causing people to build more rigs or boats isn't going to happen, at least not in the foreseeable future. And so that means we go higher for longer with rates. And so that's beneficial. Again, that doesn't mean you just blindly go out and buy the stocks because these things, the stocks with the news flow, especially in the juniors, if you go look at, relative strength, I mean, they're way overbought, okay? And I don't know how much they'll pull back. Maybe you only, if this thing really has the momentum that it might have, you may only pull back five, three or 5% and keep going higher and stay overbought for a long time. I don't know, right? I'm not a fortune teller, but, uh, you know, it's hard if you've, people, people constantly email me, have I missed it? Well, you've missed the 20 and 30 baggers, but there's still juice in the lemon. You know, if you look at the potential cash flows for some of the offshore stocks, there's no reason some of them can't go two, three, or four times higher, depending on which ones. But the time to buy rig was when it was selling for under a dollar. Now it's at eight dollars, probably going to twenty or twenty-five. So 
yeah, I mean, this is why we, why I advocate you have to get in very early and just have patience and wait. That's how the real 10 and 20, 100 baggers are made and sit. Now, I was sitting on all these uranium stocks for five years in some cases. How many of you listening to this were doing the same or willing to do, have held a stock for five years and just keep adding and adding and adding? Okay. And uh, knowing that you have the conviction that eventually the undersupply and lack of investment coupled with growing demand at some point is going to intersect and you're going to have higher prices. It took five years, but now we're starting to see the fruit of planting that orchard back then and now starting to see the fruit mature on the tree. So that's it for this week. Thank you for paying attention. Thank you for subscribing if you're a subscriber. And we'll talk to you next week.